Thank you very much for the, the kind introduction, uh, Paolo. It's always a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to keep this alive, and, and, uh, and uh, I will try to, in fact, show a few new things, a few new um, uh, 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 path and solution for patients with colorectal liver metastasis today. 95% uh, 95% of patients receive pre-op chemo before liver resection at our institution, and, and this has to be uh, uh, counted with the treatment, and, and we'll see how we integrate this with the landscape of mutations, and we've shown that RAS mutation uh, um, associated with the prognosis, and it's mainly uh, because of TP53 hiding behind RAS. 80% of patients who have RAS mutation have TP53 mutation. And we have a landscape of patients in colorectal liver metastasis. We don't, we not only have the patient we resect, we resect, we have the patient who um, uh, have received one line, two line, and third line of chemotherapy. This is a very heterogeneous population. You, you have the patients with lung metastasis, unresectable lung metastasis. We resect these patients. We resect the liver in these patients. We think this is an unresectable extrahepatic disease, but it's an exception. We don't debout. We resect these patients completely R0 in the liver. In fact, they have a, a, an intermediate survival. Um, and then there is the patient with a non-pulmonary extrahepatic disease that has to be resected. So my talk will be divided in four points here. Modern predictors of uh, uh, CLM outcome uh, uh, for all comers. You can We'll show you how to predict for all comers. You don't need all the mutation. We'll show you with RAS. Then can we personalize the prognosis? We showed you the new finding, the cancer pathways, and then the surveillance, which is an important topic for our insurance uh, approval of follow-up CT scans. So we're all concerned here with this. So modern predictors of outcome, we've shown that <clears throat> RAS can help in the prediction of prognosis, probably better than the um, uh, clinical factors. Certainly the three tiers here can be used, but these patients have to have their primary removed to determine whether the primary had positive or negative lymph nodes. Then we have this uh, um, a new proposal by uh, Hoke Lang uh, in Mainz, Germany, and uh, it's a score, another score with a lot of lines and becomes more complicating and is adding the SMAD4 mutation, which occur in fact very rarely, about 10% with patients with colorectal liver metastasis, but it's very bad prognosis if you have a SMAD4 mutation. Sasaki and Tim Pollack proposed the tumor burden score, uh, which is kind of a, a, a score that's uh, <clears throat> based on uh, Pythagorean um, uh, calculation uh, and three zones, you see the three zones there of prognosis divided uh, based on, on the size of tumor and a number of tumor, and, but it's, uh, it's dichotomized in this, in this uh, evaluation. Then we have proposed, uh, uh, we are proposing now a, a contour method, which is, a, we think, a, a, a more adequate method, really, to stratify the patients, not only with size of the tumor and number tumor, but the mutations. And, and you can put your patient somewhere here, and, and it's, a, it's a continuous variable. It's based on continuous variable, not dichotomization. And you see the big difference here. Patients with wild type, five tumors, you see less than two centimeters, greater than 65% five-year survival. This is very different from the patients with RAS mutation. And you see if you use the zones, <clears throat> Uh, as proposed by Sasaki and Pollock, you have the zones here, and clearly the zone one has a much better prognosis in the RAS wild type. Can we personalize the prognosis? And uh, our friend Rene Adam here, so gentle and smiling to us, uh, is trying to define which patient we should resect and not resect if they have no response to chemotherapy. And that happens quite 
quite commonly now after second line, third line, they don't respond. So what is the survival? So he said, if you have more than three metastases, five years survival, 8%, probably not worth operating. But this was 2004. He comes back in 2012 and he tells us that in fact, it's not enough. So now um, three metastases, more than three is not enough, greater than five, Tumor, uh, uh, centimeter tumor and CA greater than 200, you shouldn't resect. So now we are really proposing resection for, for everybody here. That's a lack of response, but there are patients with response, and these are the most important patients and the deceptive patients. We operate responding patients, and they may or may not have a, a, a good outcome, and you have these patients who re recur very early. So I'm presenting you two examples of patients, very different, two extremes, of patients who recurred very early after response. So this is the first one here. She had two nodules, she was resected, she recurred 10 months after surgery, had five nodules, responded. 10 months after her first liver surgery responded, and she responded also in an extra hepatic disease, uh, pelvic metastasis. So what do you do with this patient? We had put fiduciary, so we knew where the five metastasis was, and we had the response. I talked to my uh, high-pec team, and they said, we'll resect, we don't use high-pec now, it's a minimal peritoneal disease, there is responding. Uh, uh, um, uh, liver disease, we all good, we go for this. And uh, what we found at the second surgery, in fact, was much more disease, 14 liver tumors, 11 metastatic nodule in the peritoneum, and the patient has this uh, 140 gene panel with a triple mutation, KRAS, MAT4, and TP53, and, 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 and we, we're gonna have a bad prognosis here. You have another patient here who had this very large tumor, received chemotherapy, had to undergo an extended left hepatectomy with common duct, and recurred, recurred in a lymph node seven months after the first surgery. Very also very adverse prognosis based on this large recurrent ugly lymph node, responded to chemotherapy. We did a lymphadenectomy here, and the patient uh, in fact, had tumor viability of uh, um, uh, 10% in that lymph node that we resected. No mutation of RAS, TP53, SMAT4, follow-up, five years of chemotherapy, no evidence of recurrence. So you have a heterogeneity of patients, and maybe, maybe, biology will help you in refining your decision and your prognosis. So this is uh, Graham Poston, and we had like six or eight meetings with Dan Heller and put together this nice paper with JCO, but we had no conclusion back then. So I'll show you the pathways we have identified now in 500 patients who had complete analysis of their mutation, which ones are important. And this is a white forest. When you look at the 10 pathway in colorectal cancer, this is unbearable. And, and we don't want to use nomogram. We don't want to, to go into this detail. It's impossible for us as clinician in clinic. But in fact, there are five, <clears throat> there are five pathways here that are important. And each one contains a driver mutation. P53 pathway, TP53, WNT pathway, APC, RAS pathway, which contains RAS, any RAS, BRAF, SMAT4, TGA beta pathway, and NOTCH pathway. You see the size correlates with the uh, uh, frequency of the mutations. So you have all these other rare mutations, and we, we believe do not affect the prognosis, at least uh, for a large number of patients. And they are there, those mutations that are important. And you can take a picture here. You have these mutations, they are here with their frequency. So not all of them seem to be important, but mainly the driver mutation with the elephant in the room, TP53. So that's what we found. When we did the multivariate analysis, we found that these five pathways represented by these mutations affecting the prognosis with APC, in fact, improving 
the survival with an improvement of prognosis associated with the APC mutation, which is probably associated also with a type of colorectal cancer that has the um, um, adenoma, carcinoma sequence and not the flat polyp or the villus adenoma. Surveillance, that's my last point here. That's very important. Surveillance today, <clears throat> Um, we, we follow our patients in our clinic. Typically, we don't send back our patient to our medical oncologist. Or, um, they, they see the patient in, in post-op follow-up, but I like to follow my patient. I want to know the outcome. And the, if you look at the risk of recurrence after resection, you have the first two years. And then you have this intermediate recurrence, uh, recurrence uh, risk uh, between two and four years. So <clears throat> this has public health implication. How do you follow this patient? How often do you do your CAT scan? And in fact, we have very little guideline for follow-up of patients after resection colorectal liver meds, in fact. And, and we have really only the NCCN guideline that look at patients with stage four undergoing resection. And you see the guideline here says, first two years, three to six months. Our medical oncologist use three months. They really intensify, and, and, and insurances don't like that. And, and, and we, they are turning down the patients, in fact, for, for CAT scan follow-up. And then you have the <clears throat> two to five years, which is uh, six to 12 months, we may seem appropriate, right? But you have the Evicor now, which is a consortium of health insurance, and they produce their own guideline. I received this last week, in fact, because the insurance refused to uh, do another CAT scan uh, within a year, and it was like two and a half year after resection. They said, no, 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 after two years, the next CAT scan is gonna be in one year, so that's, you know, that we have to, we have to look into this now. Uh, and they took the extreme of the NCCN guideline, they say the CT scan, you know, 12 months, they didn't pick the six months. So they put this together, send you this package, this is a big PDF here, Evicor, and, uh, and, and we have to fight this. Plus we have to look at biology, we have to be ahead of, of, of insurance and business, and we, ha we are the physician, we have to make the decision. So if you look at the RAS status here, if patients have RAS wild type, they recur, most of them, within two years. If they have um, RAS mutation, there is this high risk time between two and, 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 and four years, and this may dictate a different surveillance. So I propose, we propose that patients who have RAS mutation be followed more intensively in this intermediate period between two and four years. And that's a difference here. If you look at the conditional survival, the risk at two years, what is the risk at two years of recurring? Very different and probably implication is that we should follow differently these patients. So it's not only before surgery, it's not only um, uh, at surgery, sometimes we have to make decisions based on mutation, but we can use mutation after surgery to make some decision for the care of our patients. So this is what we're proposing now. I presented you a lot of unpublished paper uh, that have been refused, uh, turned down by major journal, but I hope you were interested in my talk and it brought you <laughs> new, new ideas uh, how to treat patients with colorectal liver metastasis. And this is the, the, the very interesting paper here uh, I showed you the elephant, uh, uh, the most common mutation in colorectal cancer, TP53, typically worsens the prognosis in all cancer, genomic instability, extensive uh, copy number variation, more aggressive, and, uh, and the elephants are very big, but they don't get more cancer than humans because they have uh, uh, 40 copies of TP53, 20 on each allele times 
times two, that's 40, and they are really protected. You know, T53 uh, snapped into action when there is a, a, a damage to the DNA, and, uh, and we'd love to have more TP53. Thank you very much for your attention.